What's up? Is this fly or what? The year was 1976. I had met my wife, Teresa, at Moore Park College. I saw her walk into the classroom. It was a large, kind of like this, a big classroom, a couple hundred people in it. And I saw her walk in, and uh, she was like the most beautiful girl in my whole college. This was Moore Park College. And it was a humanities class. And uh, so I talked about her with my best friend who was sitting next to me that week. And I uh, said, I'm going to ask her out. And he said, I'm going to ask her out first. So, <laughs> so I, uh, the next week when I saw her in class, I, uh, they, we had an intermission because it was a long class. And we, uh, would, we would get up and walk uh, down the aisles because it's like a theater. And so Brian, he went that way and followed the crowd. And I left over the rows of chairs and uh, came up behind her and, and uh, talked with her and, and asked her out. And so I was super, super excited. So the date night came, which was a few weeks later, and I thought, I really want to impress her. <laughs> and so, so I, uh, I thought, well, I'll wear my leisure suit. <laughs> and I, I'm not kidding. This now, this is not that one. I wish I still had that one, but it was green. It had the total polyester shirt under it. I had a big old honking Christopher medal. I don't know if you guys remember those or have ever seen those. When I was a kid, everybody wore Christopher medals, and yeah, St. Christopher medals, and mine was a big pewter one. And, you know, you'd unbutton it down to here, and, you know, that medal was there. And, and I showed up at her apartment. Now, thankfully, I had a bouquet of flowers. Because, <laughs> and I, uh, Teresa's in Austin, and I called her yesterday to ask her the question again. So, t honey, tell me what was going through your mind when I showed up uh, at, at your doorstep in my green leisure suit. <laughs> and she said, literally in my mind, I'm thinking, wait, this is the cute guy from my humanities class <laughs> that showed up for our first date in a leisure suit. But then I saw the flowers. <laughs> Guys, are you listening? Uh, this is, this is, I'm giving you some tips right now of what not to do and what to do. Because, you know, again, I needed somebody to tell me it's time for a change of wardrobe. <laughs> which is really what this whole weekend is all about. It's about clothing and leisure suits and kind of understanding some things about our lives. You guys ready? You ready? Let's go into Ephesians chapter 4. I'll take this off. I know you'll need healing if I wear this <laughs> all night. But go to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to go into this great section of scripture and uh, just have a lot of fun together. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, the flowers did cover a multitude of sin. A multitude of sin. You know, it's funny, uh, on that date, we went to a, a restaurant in Ventura. And a, at the time, I didn't notice it. But it was funny because everybody was, like, staring at me. And I didn't really get it because I didn't really understand. I didn't understand that leisure suits were in for about six months. <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought it was really cool. I actually have a family photo of me and my brother in those leisure suits. He had a blue one, I think, and I had the green one. And I was trying to find it for this weekend, but I couldn't find it. Um, but anyway, it was hysterical. So time for new wardrobes. You guys ready? Verse 17, Ephesians chapter 4. Paul writes, now he says, so I tell you this. Now, by the way, if you're a guest with us, we've been in this series in Ephesians really kind of all year. We're just kind of branding it differently throughout the year. This one's called Walk This Way because we're in this section of Scripture where Paul really kind of does this. He, he flips this switch and tells us to walk this way. Now, it's important, and if, as you uh, kind of listen and pay attention to that, I'll, I'll teach you some things about what, what we mean and what Scripture means when it says walk this way because you have to be careful of that concept. It's not simply you, you know, gutting it up and choosing to be godly, okay? There's a work of the Spirit that's involved. Uh, so, so as we go, I'll point that out, all right? So P Paul writes, so I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord. Notice the expression, in the Lord. 
He says that you must no longer live as Gentiles do. Now, if you're new to Scripture, when the Bible, generally speaking, talks about Gentiles, it basically means non-Jews, non-followers of the Old Testament law, non-followers of what we would call our Old Testament, okay? So Gentiles would, in our context, it would basically be those of us who have not begun a relationship with Christ yet, or anybody you know that would not have begun a relationship with Christ yet. So you may be coming and thinking about, you know, beginning a relationship with Jesus. What would that look like? And, and so forth. And, and so Paul's going to kind of outline the differences, okay, the core differences. So, so here we go. Uh, and insist on it in the Lord that you must no, no longer live as Gentiles do in the futility or the meaninglessness, literally that word in the Greek, which is the original language, it means a kind of meaninglessness, which remember Ephesians 1.11 when we were there in chapter 1, 1.11, in fact, Pastor Danny kind of quoted it a bit. It's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we're living for. So it's, it's very much this idea of our identity being in Christ, which Paul talks about, remember, 37 times in this letter. He talks about the idea of your identity and you being in Christ 37 times just in this one letter. So it's amazing. It's, it's impressive. So in the futility of their thinking, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. So notice the kind of progression here, the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity. This was me before I became a Christ follower. And they are full of greed. And again, notice the, the whole progression of, of idea. And then verse 20, it's a hinge point. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to, what to say? To put it off, right? To put off your old self, to take off those articles of clothing, you know, to, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to, and, uh, it says, and to be made new in the attitude of your minds. And then this is your memory verse. You guys have a memory verse uh, on your chair somewhere. Pick it up. It's this black card. It says, walk this way. And here's our memory verse for this week. We're gonna, I think I'm going to have, I want to say there's memory verses in every week of this series, but I'm not positive. But I want you to take these and stick them, you know, like on your mirrors or in your cars. Um, guys, you can put these over your speedometers. You don't need that thing anyway. Um, <laughs> so, you know, put it somewhere. <laughs> but it, the key, the key is always be the second fastest person on the freeway, okay? That's the, key, that's the whole key. Uh, anyway, to, be, to put on the new self, okay, the new self created to be, and this is an amazing uh, verse. You're created to be like God, like Jesus, like to have the mind of Christ, to be in Christ. In true righteousness and holiness. Oh, it's such an awesome verse. So it's all about this kind of putting off and putting on. So what is it that we're not supposed to wear? What is it that we're not supposed to wear? By the way, uh, Teresa has had a profound influence on me and what I wear. Like my whole, uh, we've been married 42 years. When I got married, like I grew up in an era. Now, Teresa is from the Valley. She grew up in L.A. She went to Taft High, Okay. A very famous high school. How many of you know, when I say Taft High, you know what I'm talking about? Right. If you don't, you can Google it. Watch out, though. Uh, <laughs> but, but anyway, she was, you know, she grew up in the Valley. There are six girls. They're all stunning. Her mother won the Mrs. Los Angeles Beauty Contest six weeks after her sixth child or fifth child. So they're, like her, the girls, they're beautiful. I grew up in Camarillo. Okay, when I, when I lived in Camarillo, it was 6,000 people. Uh, there was only one high school. It was much smaller than Tierra Santa. I could go two blocks from my house and hunt and fish and ride dirt bikes and whatever. Um, so I grew up that way. So I was, I mean, by the way, Teresa <laughs> later on asked me, because believe it or not, I wore this, suit, this leisure suit to a wedding that we got invited to. <laughs> and by then she had enough relational capital with me to go, hey, uh, you know, 
that leisure suit, like those are not in anymore. And, and, and by the way, where did you buy it? And I bought it at Sears. We would go, I mean, I'm sorry if you shop at Sears for clothes. But I, I grew up that way. We shopped at Sears for clothes. And I, my uniform, like my day-to-day -day, uh, outfit was blue jeans and a white t-shirt. How many ever watched Happy Days? Okay, so the Fonz, right? He's a little bit before my era, but we're close enough. So that's how I grew up. Having said that, Teresa grew up in the Valley. She knew how to dress. She knew how to do stuff like that. And I needed her advice. I needed her wisdom. This is why I want you in a life group. In a life group, <laughs> you're, they're gonna, they're, you're gonna build this relationship with people. And they're gonna tell you things about yourself. They're gonna tell you things about scripture that you don't see. We'll, we'll see it as we go along. But this is all about what not to wear in our lives. Paul says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off this old self because it's being corrupted by its deceitful desires. And all of us struggle with this. All of us, uh, all of us struggle. This is not a kind of like you get done with it. Remember, he's writing to the church, okay? Paul's writing to the church at Ephesus. He's writing to Christ followers about our tendencies and, and, our, and our way in life. So you have to identify what doesn't fit anymore, or what's out of style. I had no clue leisure search suits. I thought I was just awesome showing up. By the way, those polyester shirts, man, they'd make you have the worst B.O. I mean, it was, it, was, it was horrible, but I was just out of touch. Anyway, <laughs> so identify what doesn't fit anymore. Again, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God. When I was not a Christ follower, I didn't understand this. I just, I just thought that this was the way life was. I, I believed in God and Jesus in a certain way, but I never understood the gospel. I never understood any of the transformational power of having a relationship with Jesus. And, and this, is, this is Paul's statement with regard to everybody that is around us. You guys have to remember, you live in a county where 92 to 94 percent of this county does not go to church on any regular basis. Roughly 92 to 94 percent of San Diego County is not, they don't walk with Jesus. They're, they're spiritual. You got to remember, people are very spiritual. I haven't met an atheist in a long time. Uh, none of my doctors, to my, and I have a lot of them, uh, are, are atheists uh, to my knowledge, and we talk about faith a lot. And, and you know, it, it, they're, people are very spiritual. It's just that we're lost in that, okay? We're lost in that. You may be here tonight, and that's where you are. I have tremendous news for you, and it's in these scriptures, and we'll talk about it. But this is the way we are. So like in your ways, like in your life, are you struggling with rejecting God's ways right now? Living life on your own terms. This is, this is the way of our culture. This is hard for us. Being willfully ignorant where we're just not becoming people of the book and we're not learning the scriptures and, and we're not understanding the truths of God and we're kind of willfully doing this though. We're not having our devotional life. We're, we're struggling with these kinds of things and we're refusing to listen. Like, like in this environment right now, I want you to understand all the time, I try to bring this up as often as I can, but like, so you're listening to me, but are you hearing what God's wanting to say to you in the midst of what you're doing? Like this isn't a humanities class. I want you to take notes, but I want you to write down mostly the things that God's saying to you. And is how is this in any way descriptive of you? Because the hardening principle that's in this passage is no joke. The hardening principle. In, in, in the verse, he says, having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves so over to sensuality so as to indulge every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. Write this uh, down on your notes. Write down Hebrews 11, Hebrews 11, 25. Hebrews 11, 25. You can look it up later. Hebrews 11, 25. And then write this down. Write this down. Because the Bible doesn't back away from this. Sin has its pleasure for the moment. Sin has its pleasure for the moment. You know, I grew up in the drug culture, uh, you know, cocaine and all that. So I know that I could draw a line on a table of Coke and I could snort that uh, cocaine uh, into my nose and I would have a very, very predictable response within a few moments. And it would be a bell curve. And it would have pleasure for the moment. 
And then comes the very predictable crash. And that's the way sin is. And that's why in the drug culture, you have to snort another lion. And then another lion. And, and then you become more and more callous. You become more and more uh, kind of a victim of the power of, of the sin. This is how sin works. The Bible doesn't back up from that. You have to understand that. This is why we struggle with sin. <laughs> like, you know, this is why, like, if I'm a, if I'm a you know, anything, like any kind of uh, brokenness, like if I eat too much candy, for example, <laughs> why do I eat too much candy? Because it's fun. <laughs> How many of you are lovers of chocolate, right? And chocolate's fine. You just can't, you know, eat bowls of it, right? That's why you have to watch me around Rolos. <laughs> I don't want them in my house. <laughs> I, that's why I don't like to buy any kind of candy at Costco. It comes in large containers. <laughs> so this is what Paul's talking about. Like, are you becoming calloused and cynical? This is 19. Are you living only for pleasure? This is our... Uh, this is our culture right now, right? Like, it my, and, and it's my, I'll take it. I'll, it's it's my, my generation's fault. My generation spun on this. You, you know, I'm a hippie, right? Uh, that generation. Our, our mantra, if it feels good, what? Do it. If it feels good, do it. And the whole university system shifted in my generation. And here we are today, again, struggling so much for ethics, uh, craving more constantly. Write this down, write this down. Uh, idols demand sacrifices. An idol is anything that gets you in the way between you and your relationship with God, and it'll have horizontal implications. So for example, if you're choosing to hold on to bitterness toward a parent, uh, like so somebody who's hurt you or abused you or whatever, and you're holding on to this wounding, that becomes an idol, and that idol will demand sacrifices regularly. Idols always do. This is why, uh, you know, the scriptures talk about idolatry all the time and, and the dangers of it. Now, here's the, here's the most important thing of the night maybe for you. And that is that God loves you more than you could possibly imagine. You'll never be able to imagine the love that God has for you. I really do believe that part of the reason that he, uh, you know, had us have babies is because uh, it, it sort of helps us to understand the love of God. Like when you have babies, right? Like when, how many of you have had a baby? Okay. Like when you have a baby, it's weird, right? Like you, you, by the way, Pastor Isaac posted it, I think yesterday on Instagram, our Hillcrest pastor, he, uh, he uh, Kelsey's pregnant, they're gonna have a baby. So it's very exciting uh, for them, unplanned, <laughs> but exciting. <laughs> you know, let's launch a campus and have a baby. <laughs> anyway, um, but, but uh, and Isaac, were, uh, Isaac and I were talking about this on Thursday, uh, about this passage. I think, it, I think, and Isaac agrees that, like, when you have a baby, it's freaky, especially as a guy, because, you know, I think generally guys have a harder time with kids and raising them and loving them and doing all that stuff that, that uh, we're just challenged with, but there is something about it. Like when you have that baby, it's like in a, in a moment, you like die for that baby. It's weird. It's like, it's like something that almost that happens to you, which is in this passage, okay? See, God loves you more than you could possibly imagine, but he loves you too much to leave, to leave you there, to leave you like this, to leave you in where you are spiritually, at any given moment, by the way, he's always trying to develop you, because why? Because he loves you. It's like a parent. And by the way, uh, my kids are 44, 38, 35. Listen up. How many of you have kids younger than that? Okay. Listen very carefully. You will never graduate from the discipleship component of your children. Okay? It'll shift. It'll shift on you. But you will always be a clarion call into those children. I don't care if they're 40 or two. My wife, Teresa, is in Austin right now babysitting the two twin granddaughters who are two, and Holden, who is four. Ryan and Melanie, of course, flew to Amsterdam for a vacation. But Teresa's there babysitting those kids, and, and it's just this thing. You want to develop them. 
because they, they're just like two, they're girls. They're two now. Again, what do we call the two-year-old stage? Terrible twos. You know, they're just in it to win it, man. <laughs> but Teresa's like all week she's going to work on developing them. Why? Because she loves them. This is how God is with you. This is what this passage is all about. This, the, remember, the whole letter is all about the love affair that God has with us. He says, put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. So the old stuff, the old stuff, you got to work on this constantly. We still struggle with the bumper sticker that says, the one who dies with the most toys wins. We still struggle with money equaling happiness. Now, God wants to bless you. Of course, he wants to bless you. That's his... That's his gem. Why? Because he's like a dad. He's like a dad. He wants to bless you. I'm flying my two sons and I to uh, El Salvador uh, so that they can surf. I'll watch, but <laughs> why? Because I want to spend time with them. Why? Because they're 35 and they're 38. And life is pressure for them. They're both you know, vice presidents at a company, the same company, there's lots and lots of pressure on them. This is how God is with you. But you, it, it, it involves us putting off our old self, as, which is being corrupted by the deceitful desire. So how do I dress for my new life, right? How do I get rid of the leisure suit? How do I, how do I, how do I do it? And Ryan, my youngest, he's been very helpful to me too, and his wife, Melanie. Remember, I'm a project when it comes to dress, right? So... Melanie was the Hurley rep for Orange County. How many of you know what Hur Hurley is? Hurley clothing, right? Okay, so she was the Hurley rep, and so she would tell me all the time, Gramps, or Dad, you know, don't wear that, <laughs> you know, here. <laughs> and sometimes she would even take me shopping online and show me stuff and teach me how to dress, and they, they have to constantly work on it with me. This is why, again, you need to be in a life group. People will tell you, not just style stuff, but godly stuff godly stuff, what to wear, what not to wear. That, however, is not the way of life you learn. Notice, you learned. So we learn. This is why we're here together. We learn, right? We learn when we heard about Christ and we're taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. This is why I want you to become people of the scriptures. I want you to work out your, your, um, you know, your devotional life so that you have your devotions. And it really is, it is something that you have to work on from a disciplined perspective. How many of you are excited that football season is on right now? Raise your hands. I, I am, right? Raise them up high. I want to see, I want to see. It'd be fun to go around. In your life groups, you can do this. Who are you fans of and everything? How many of you are Chargers fans still? Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm, I'm, I, it's kind of like being dumped by a girlfriend. I just don't know how to feel yet. But... <laughs> But my point is, is that if you're a football fan, you will spend hours and hours a week watching a football game. S see what I'm saying? The way of life you learn. You have to learn the ways of Jesus. So this is great. You're here for an hour. That's cool. I want you to be in a life group, so you'll be there for an hour. That's good. I want you to cultivate a devotional life. There is a learning to it. And, and you have to be receptive to new ways of thinking new ways of seeing the world that you don't necessarily get now. This is why you need each other. I, I remember um, back in the day, uh, it was actually shortly after, 70, after this leisure suit. I was in our OB campus from 1976 to 1986. I went on staff there in 1980. That's why I've been in the ministry for a long time. So, and I had this friend named Jigsaw, and he, we were in a, the same uh, life group together. It was actually a uh, uh, Beth, 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 Churchill. This was when I was in the Colossians 2-7 group like you were doing. Uh, so anyway, uh, Jigsaw was his name. He was in my life group. And uh, so we were friends, right? And so we'd talk about everything. And again, part of my goal for you in your life groups is not just that you're in a life group, but that you make these spiritual friends like that are, they become kind of like spiritual best friends. Now this takes a long time to do, but that's my goal. Anyway, Jigsaw and I were very good friends. And 
And so Jig and I were talking about lust and struggles with lust. He was a single guy, I was married. And, and so Jigsaw was being very transparent with me, very honest with me about his life and his struggles with lust. And I said, so Jig, tell me how, how, how does it work for you? What, what are the triggers? How does, how does lust get fired up in you? And he goes, well, there's lots of ways it happens. And I go, well, tell me like you're, like where do you go? I go, do you ever go to the beach? He goes, oh, I love the beach. And I said, oh, that's cool. I love the beach too. Um, and I said, so how, how do you, where do you go to the beach? How do you do that? And he goes, well, because he was a, a carpenter. So carpenters, generally speaking, you know, they work like seven to three. They, you know, it's very finite. They work eight hours a day, you know, because everything else is overtime. And so Jig, where, you know, he got off every day at three o'clock. And I said, well, how does it work? He goes, well, I, I go to the beach every day because I like to go sit at the sun. And I go, oh, <laughs> which beach do you go to? And he goes, oh, I love to go to PB and sit on the wall. And I'm like, so Jig, Jig, walk this through with me. Okay, and again, new ways of thinking. Jig, walk this through with me. So you, uh, you love the beach. I get it, you love the beach. You like PB. I get it, you like PB. You go sit on the wall in PB at 3.30. I, I said, how many days a week do you do that? Well, he goes, as many as I can. And I said, well, Jig, like, I've sat on that wall. I can't take that wall longer than 10 minutes. When I sit on that wall and it's hot out, I know I'm a dead man walking right there. Like, Jigsaw, you, I would suggest that you don't go, here's what you can do, Jig. OB has the longest pier on the West Coast. Go walk on the pier. Generally, there'll be a lot less skin on the pier. <laughs> See, these are just, it just really, he had gotten wrapped up into, and he wasn't adding A plus B. These are why we need each other, and this is why we need scripture, okay? That's what Paul's talking about. To be, now notice, this is very important. Uh, earlier I told you about, uh, don't, it's not just suck it up, buttercup, okay? It's not just grit it out. Notice the language. Remember, every word of scripture is inspired by God, breathed out by God, every single word, okay? Now, uh, in the, this is a, in the passive tense, which I know that's challenging. We can speak English, but we don't really study grammar. <laughs> um, this is something that is, it happens to you first and foremost by a work of grace. Okay, if you're taking notes, write down Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Very, very important in the letter of Ephesians. You know, it's by grace you're saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one can boast. And then he talks about the works. He talks about, you know, what we put off and on. So it's very important that you understand to be made new. And as you get into different experiences, something happens on the inside of you. Then you live out of this reality that becomes a, an existential, a, a true, legit, experiential time with God where, where you live out of that wholeness. Uh, if you're new, you, you probably not heard me share that I have two 18-year-old grandsons who just joined the Marines. They are at MCRD. I can't see them uh, because they're not allowed to, but they're at MCRD. And Cody, who's my 18-year-old grandson, he wrote me my first letter back. Now, Teresa's writing him every single day of boot camp. I've written him, you know, five times, whatever. I, I write him when she hands me the card and says, hey, you need to write Cody. Thank you, honey. <laughs> see, we need each other. Anyway, I want to read it for you, okay? So he's in boot camp. So he's, something's happening inside of him. I knew it would, because I, you know, I was in the army. Okay, so listen to this. Nani and Gramps, I'm so sorry it took so long to write back. I've been super busy as a scribe, a fire team leader, and helping around the house. That's what they call the barracks, apparently. We didn't call it that when I was in the army. Uh, we had all kinds of expletives for it, but <laughs> anyway. But he's become a leader. He got chosen, I asked Adam, uh, Harris, he's a captain in the Marine Corps. I asked him, what's a fire leader, fire team leader? Apparently that's a leader of a mini unit in his platoon, right? So four people, four people. So he's the leader of those four, got it. Anyway, but boot camp has been hard and fun so far. <laughs> Plus Nico, that's his brother, they went in buddy basic. Nico uh, is with me, so it makes it a little easier. By the way, I went buddy basic through boot camp. That's a great way if you're coaching a young person how to do boot camp. If they can find a friend to go through it with, it's, they have a high, much higher rate of success and it being a good experience. Anyway, 
uh, uh, plus Nico's with me and it makes it a little easier. Anyways, the events are honestly pretty fun. <laughs> we have an obstacle course, a rope course, and a bunch of workout routines. And on Sundays, we have to go to church. And we have prayer groups at night. I love the Marines. Uh, also, Nico is a prayer leader. How cool is that? Question mark. This is an 18-year-old guy, okay? Uh, anyways, boot camp has been easy and challenging at the same time. It's easy because all you have to do is be loud, be fast, and listen. But it's challenging because not everybody does that. <laughs> <laughs> Other than that, boot camp has been pretty good so far. I've learned how to save a life, take apart a M16 uh, service rifle, and a bunch more. Anyways, how are you guys, question mark? I miss you guys a bunch. Love, Cody. P.S. P.S. Are you going to come for my graduation? <laughs> <laughs> Am I going to come for his graduation? Dude, are you kidding me? I'll be crying in that graduation is what I'll be doing. But see, it's something, this is a work of God that he, does, he wants to do in you by his grace. He wants to constantly, it's like Romans 12, be transformed by the renewing of your minds. He says, in, uh, this is Psalms uh, 139, David's Psalm. It's a beautiful prayer. See if there's any offensive way in me and notice the language and lead me in the way everlasting. That's what God wants to do in you. Paul does it this way in Philippians 4. He says, finally, whatever is true, right, noble, pure, lovely, admirable, if anything, in, remember, he's writing from prison, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, what's he say? Think on these things. This is why I want, you, I want to give you guys memory verses. So you develop meditation and develop the art of meditation in your lives. Now, I want to recommend a resource to you. This is an incredible book on the battlefield of the mind. How many of you have ever heard of Joyce Meyer? Yeah, a lot of you are super fans of her. She has conferences and all kinds of stuff. Uh, but this is a great resource. You could take a picture of it if you want. Uh, I, I can't recommend this book highly enough, and the way she scales it in the book is really, really cool. A um, bunch of the gals in my sermon team recommended it to us, and, and uh, you know, there's this quote, our past, this is a great quote, by the way, our past may explain why we're suffering, but we must never use it as an excuse to stay in bondage. This is why we have Celebrate Recovery, Grief Share, Divorce Care, all of our support ministries are, are kind of process-oriented to help us learn how to move past hurts, hang-ups, and addictions, and habits, and all kinds of stuff, but this book is a great, great resource. So what are you feeding your mind? You know, it's kind of the old, uh, what is it, junk in, junk out. Like, what are, you, what are you watching on TV? Oh, come on, Pastor Mike. I, I don't mean this in any kind of legalistic way. I just mean you need to pay attention to it. You need to pay attention to it. Is it, like, like if you have kind of greed firing, you know, discontentment with where you are financially. I mean, Instagram can be dangerous this way. You know, hashtag super life. Uh, whatever. <laughs> so what, what are you feeding? Remember, write this down. What I feed grows. What I feed grows. This is why bitterness is like you taking poison and expecting the other person to die. Okay? But what you feed grows. What you starve dies. What you starve dies. So there may be a season where you, I don't know, fast socials or uh, a, a TV show that you're watching and just super into it. Um, you know, whatever. I, I don't know how that looks for you. And I'm, I, am I challenging my default thoughts and actions? Like you have, you get, this is why marriage therapy can be so helpful to us because it, it, it jars you out of your current worldview. You're like in habits, like, it's like in my leisure suit. I thought that thing was the bomb. That's why I wore it. I wanted to impress. You dressed to impress. I had no idea, right? <laughs> but this is what life groups, it naturally happens in a life group. And you have to choose actions that match your new thoughts. Like what you live out, and this has to be spirit-led and spirit-empowered, but as you choose to act out of those new thoughts that God has, to, has for you, it, it sort of changes your way you're wired, actually. Like on a, a psychophysiological level, even, it'll cause new 
um, kind of relationships inside of your brain to take place, and you'll develop actually new habits and new, new ways of thought. That's what Paul says, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. This is why I picked it as your memory verse. It's such a great word, uh, uh, verse. And holiness... The root idea of holiness is separated apart for a purpose. Separated, it has moral implications, ethical implications, of course, but it, its root idea is separated apart for a purpose. You have a purpose in life, and it's only in Christ that you're going to discover who you are and what you're living for. Paul says it this way in Colossians. It's like, a, by the way, Ephesians and Colossians are sister letters. They're, they're very similar to each other. If you study one you, and then you study the other, you'd see it in two seconds. But this is, this is great. As, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly what? There it is. Holy and dearly loved. Clothe yourselves. And, and this is like a Galatians 5.22 kind of idea. You know, the fruit of the spirit passage. It's like a list. So look at the list. Compassion, kindness. How many of you have kids? How many of you have struggled with being kind to them? You know lying's a sin, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, sometimes you just want to slug them, right? You know, they're grown and they're just running crazy, right? I'm just like, really, dude? So, you know. You just have to, you have to, that's the deal. Kindness. What's the next word? Humility. Humility. Then what? No. And then the, what's the last one? There it is again. Patience. Now, I want to meditate on this verse for a second, but I want to quote Joyce again. This is a great, uh, great little statement. Patience is not the ability to wait, but the ability to keep a good attitude <laughs> while you're waiting. How many of you are waiting on something right now? Yeah, it's very common, right? You're waiting on something. So this is the hard part is to have a good attitude while you're waiting, right? <laughs> and that's the deal. Now, let's meditate on this verse. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience okay those ideas what is it that God wants you to see as you sit here because clearly he didn't leave you out like he didn't want everybody else in the room to be here to see this verse and to hear this message but not you he's got you here for something now you had to make a decision to come Maybe it's the food <laughs> that we're going to eat. I don't know. But God's in it. And he has this verse for you. Okay? And you have your memory verse. So let's bow our heads and close our eyes. And we're going to pray that the Lord will speak to you. Okay? So let's pray. Lord, I just pray right now, God, that you help us to see and to experience and to hear your voice as to what you want to say to us. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, the Lord spoke one of those things to you, and you know that's what you need to pray for. Raise your hands up. That's you. That's what he's doing in your life. You got it. So most of us have that. We get that, okay? You can put your hands down. Are you here and your life is not right with God? It's just not right. It, maybe you've never begun a relationship with him. Maybe you have, but it's, you know, crashed and burned. And you need to pray about that. Like, that's where you are. Raise your hands up. That's me, Pastor Mike. I need to pray about that. I need to pray about that where I am. Okay? God bless you guys. You can put your hands down. So let's pray together, okay? Let's pray up loud together. Just repeat after me. What matters is the words in your own heart. I'm just helping you with them, okay? So let's pray. Lord Jesus, I want to learn from you. I want to be transformed by you in my heart, in my insides. I want to be made new constantly in the attitude of my mind. So help me to learn. Help me to watch Help me to listen. Help me to meditate. Help me to spend time with you. 
so that I can hear your voice. Speak to my heart. Give me forgiveness and mercy. Help me to walk as a person of God. Help me to be like God in true righteousness and true holiness. And I will give you all of the praise for that. I will give you all of the glory for that. I will take no credit for it to myself. I will applaud you, God, for what you are doing in my life. Because it's your story, then it's my story. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Give God a hand, yeah? Awesome. awesome.